It's exciting. First time being back in this room, and you know, Praise Youth has told me, man, the energy in here is crazy. And it's crazy because I remember the very first time I showed up at Praise Church, sat right there where Mr. Mathis is sitting. And I asked somebody earlier today, and I was like, man, Kendall, where'd you sit at? She said, right there. I said, Jonathan Willis, where'd you sit at? He said, right where Cannon's sitting. And I remember sitting here, coming in from Atlanta, Georgia, not knowing anybody, and walking into this church and being like, man, Jesus, the Holy Spirit is in this room. And what's crazy is, is probably a very similar feeling to what I had over there was like the first time I walked in the doors. And God has been consistent. It's not about the room. It's not about the band. But Jesus' faithfulness, his consistency, his kindness, all the attributes of God show up wherever you're at. So if you're at Lamar, you remember that, that it doesn't just take place in this room. It doesn't just take place at the major building. Like Carly was saying, the Holy Spirit resides inside of you. And so if we don't take away anything from tonight, we take away that the living, breathing God is in you wherever you go. And it's not just something I formulated or wrote up. Like, that is a real, real thing. But for us 18 to 25-year-olds, so many times what happens is, is, man, I can't, I can't, I don't got time. Uh. I was at a lunch one-on-one with a guy a couple weeks ago. And uh, we're sitting across from the table, and he goes, Darian, man, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. My life would be so much easier if I wasn't so busy. And in my head, I'm thinking to myself, and I'm going, yeah, bro, your life would be a lot, a lot better if you weren't so busy. So why don't you just create time? Why don't you rearrange your schedule? Why don't you? And in my head, I'm thinking to myself, well, if you're so busy, what is it that you're busy with? Because see, what happens is, for us, the first thing that gets cut when your life gets busy, just for whatever reason, it doesn't make any sense to me, is Jesus. All of a sudden, school gets way more important. All of a sudden, your boyfriend, your girlfriend get way more important. All of a sudden, what was important on a Sunday morning is no longer important because you're busy. Man, I I can't wake up in the morning because I'm busy. No, but you have time. You do, but the, the, the thing is, is you have time and you're choosing to do other things with it. You're choosing to do homework. You're choosing to focus on your, on your career. You're choosing to focus on your boyfriend, your relationship, your husband. Whatever. You're choosing to focus on everything else in your life but spending time with God. Because what the world says, get a good job, find a wife, find a husband, get a nice house, and you're going to be okay. So we put all of our time in those things. We sell out. We're all the way in invested in that. And then when it's convenient or when things get the fan, that's when we go back to Jesus. That's when we want to be in a small group. That's when we want to show back up to the major building. Jesus, I need you. I want you. But man, you found time then, didn't you? But when things were really, really, really getting gritty, Your hands go up. We fall to our knees. And so what I want to talk about tonight is you do have time. You've got an opportunity today to rearrange your schedule. You set out time. Some of you guys got off work. Some of you guys drove here 30 minutes. Some of you guys, you know, rearrange your entire day for this. And I'm like, man. But some of you guys, this is just a, I checked off my list. I showed up on Tuesday. Feel good about life. Some of you guys are like, ah, I committed, I'm all in, first Tuesday, here I am. And I'm here to tell you, this is great and this is incredible, but for my 35-minute message, it's not going to sustain you for 31 days. Today is September the 5th. So if the next time you dive into God's Word is going to be October 3rd or whatever that is, (laughs) you got a long road ahead of you. Today's September the 7th, sorry. But all that being said is that if you're going to go 30 days without getting connected to God, we got a long, long, long road ahead of you guys. So what do we do, right? 
value what's important in your life, like actually, actually important. Because if getting a 4.0 and making $12 an hour at your job is more important than getting connected with God, you've got your priorities messed up. Because that's not going to take you to eternity. That's not going to take you further in your walk. That's not going to take you where you want to go. That $12 an hour job, that 4.0, you're a millennial. You're going to get a new job in three years anyways. So, so I'm not saying school is not important. I'm not saying making money is not important because I got bills too, right? I got things I got to do. But what I'm saying is we have to reorder the time, reorder the heart, reorder our mind, and say the first things first is Jesus. Not my girlfriend, not my boyfriend, not the food truck outside, not the chairs in this room, not the Walker building, not praise young adults, but Jesus. And all of those things that we set up here are all vessels and steps to hopefully get you in the door so that when you walk in here, man, your heart's available. And so I don't know what your, what your day looks like tomorrow morning, but the first thing that I would do when I walk out of here would be like, man, what's my schedule look like? Because I do have time. Now, I might want to sleep in bed. Now, I might want to go talk to my girlfriend, but I do have time. Have y'all seen the TikTok? And I'm not even really on TikTok, but I saw this on Instagram. It's the, uh, the one where it's like, is he rich or is he hot, right? Like, do you really like him or does he, does he just have nice hair? Or it's like the girl or she's, you know, they're like dancing. It's like, dun -dun 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 -dun. you know what I'm talking about? Anyways, if you don't, then honestly, that's probably better for you. But the whole point and the reason why I say that is just asking the question, like, are you busy or are you just a procrastinator? Like, are you busy or do you just not want to commit? Like, are you busy? Or are you overcommitting yourself? And so you're always saying yes to everything over here that you can't ever say yes to this. Like, I'm all of them, honestly, if I'm being honest with you guys. Like, if, if I'm being real with you, I'm so busy that I can't wake up on a Saturday morning and read my Bible. And I'm the pastor, right? Like, so what am I doing with my, I'm like, man, like, what am I, why? Am I staying out too late on Friday? Man, if this, this God who changed my life, he's important. He's worth that but I'm so busy. I'm so busy. And so are you so busy that you make time on Thursday night to go hang out at Woodrow's or you go make time to go to Red's or wherever you go hang out at, but you can't make time for a small group? Man, if you're so busy that you're telling yourself, you're like, man, this God thing is important. Man, this God, I need you, but I can't make time. Why? Seriously, that's a, that is a crazy backwards thought. And so we scroll, and we go, and we go, and we say, man, I'm doing all these things. Or maybe really what it is, is you're so busy serving, you're so busy showing up, you're so busy checking off all the boxes that you're not even connecting with God because you're just here all the time, and you're just going through the motions. You're just going and going and going. And man, I, I'm saying this. I want you serving in this church. I want you in a small group. But if you are not connecting to God and doing those things, you're just checking off the box. And I'm not saying you're wasting your time, but I'm saying getting connected with God is far more important than just going and doing it. Because this right here, when you get connected and you're plugged in, doing those things is an overflow and people want to be around you. They start saying, man, I want to serve on the usher team. I see Patrick. I see Jacorian. And those guys have spent time with God. But when you're just serving, you're just showing up, you got the sad face on. Nobody wants to be on the usher team. Everybody wants to be on first impressions. It's like, man, those people are happy over there. Like, those people love God. It's not true. Everybody loves God on my team. Yes, we, we'd be doing it. Anyways. But I say all that to say, truthfully, is when you create time and you reorder your heart, you reorder your schedule, you reorder your time, you will find yourself doing far more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine because you're spending and connecting time with God. So all of a sudden you find yourself getting more blessed. You find yourself finding more time to connect connected with God. You find more rest. You find more opportunities because you decided to say, man, Jesus is first. And so I don't have time, but I'm going to create time. And I don't know how or why it works, but when I put God first on my little bit of schedule, I all, all of a sudden, I find myself rested. I find myself with more opportunity. I find myself with more opportunity to go and serve. I find myself, the tasks that I was nervous and stressed out about because I spent time with God at first, 
It's like it's easy. I'm like, God, if it was this easy, why don't I just spend more time with you in the first place? And I feel like every time he's like, yeah, duh. It's that easy. Choose me first. Not choose that first. Choose me first. There's a story in Luke. It talks about Mary and Martha, right? So if you don't know what it is, it's uh, Mary and Martha are the brother of Lazarus. Lazarus was the guy who was dead. Jesus brought him back to life. And so throughout this little course, it's four verses. It's super quick. But Mary and Martha are opening up their home to Jesus and the disciples. And so Jesus and the disciples are running through the town, and they stop at Mary and Martha's house. Well, Martha is really mad at Mary because Mary is just like one of those roommates who is chilling and is not doing all her side of the work. So Martha is explaining to Mary, she's like, hey, girl, like you need to like help. You need to figure out your side of the, the chores, or you need to do what you said you were going to do. And so Jesus walks in the house. And so I'm going to break it down uh, kind of verse by verse. It's Luke 10, 38, 42. And uh, it's going to be our first little passage of scripture tonight. It says this, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened up her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the, Lord, at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that, he had, that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has let me do all the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So first time reading it, right, I'm like, okay, four verses, and I've probably read this thing a hundred times, and so I'm scrolling through, I'm like, what's sticking out? Well, I did some homework, right? And so giving you guys some context to it all, right? So Jesus is here with his disciples, so if anybody has a home or anybody's got an apartment and you're like me, if somebody tells me they're about to show up, I immediately go into OCD mode, and I'm like, I got to clean everything, everything's got to be stacked, it's got to be perfectly placed here, I got to turn the candles on, the lights are on, everything is just like ideal, right? Well, Martha here is explaining to Mary, she's like, whoa, 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 you are my sister, and you're not doing your fair share of the trade here. So Jesus and the 12 are about to show up. So it's got to be a pretty big house or maybe decently sized, right? For 13 people plus Mary and Martha to be there. And so it's got to be this opportunity where Martha is stressing out. She's probably a little bit anxious. She's probably a little bit stressed because Jesus is about to come over. It's not like your friend. And he's not texting you or DMing you and saying like, hey, I'll be there in 15. He's like, yo, I'm here. Like, knock, knock. They didn't have cell phones back then. Right? So verse 38, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to the village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. So here we got two people in the same house, and uh, the responsibility, because people are coming over, is to cook and to clean. Verse 39, she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. So we got one person slaving over the other, and the, another person mesmerized at, at Jesus, sitting at the Lord's feet, listening to what he was saying. So there's some tension, obviously, being built here. And then we go, and uh, verse 41, it says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. So I can imagine right there, Martha's probably getting frustrated with Jesus, which obviously probably takes some guts, but she's saying, Jesus, why is it that you're not mad at Mary? I'm the one doing all the work here. I'm the one who's cleaning, cooking, and Mary is sitting at your feet listening to you. That's not fair. That's not right. See, in a traditional woman's role, it was unthinkable for a woman to sit at the feet of the rabbi and listen to him teach. Girls stayed at home because they were illiterate. They weren't allowed to. So the only place they could, they could, they could gather was the woman's court of the temple. Nowhere near were men. So not only is Mary here breaking a social norm, by sitting at the feet with men other around her, but she's also breaking the stereotype of, I'm not cooking, I'm not cleaning, because I want to be with Jesus. And so what Martha is not understanding is, is in her head, she's like, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this, because if I don't do this, then everything else is going to fall apart. And what Mary is saying is all of those things mean nothing, because the Lord Jesus is in the room. And so I'm going to choose to listen to what he has to say first, and then I'll go and help you out. And so I can imagine probably what's taking place in this room right now is Martha's over here cooking and cleaning. She's probably got the, you know, sweep and the broom and all things. And over here, Jesus is sitting, probably talking some profound message. And Mary is just sitting here like this. Oh, man. 
Jesus, you're so good. She's listening. She's taking notes. She's probably encountering God and saying, how could I even focus on cleaning? How could I even focus on the task? How could I even focus on the schedule? Until I get connected to you, then that doesn't matter. And I promise you, Martha was probably sitting there also, and she's probably thinking to herself, maybe if I were to be listening to this message, listening to Jesus, he'd probably say something right now that makes me be like, man, this doesn't matter anymore. But her schedule, her time, maybe the orders of her heart, she was so focused on something else that she missed Jesus in the room. She was so focused on the plan. She was so focused on getting to the next step and cleaning up and getting everything ready. She missed the whole point. She missed the relationship, the opportunity to connect and talk to a Jesus. She missed it because she was so focused on her plan, her five-year plan. She was focused on maybe put yourself in this, graduating. She was focused on working the job. She was focused on doing everything else in the way that the world said, her mom said, her dad said, because she wanted to take the next step. And so we have to ask the question tonight, what's your schedule look like? Where's your relationship at? Are you Mary? The world's going, the world's going, and you can't focus on anything else but Jesus. Or are you Martha? Jesus is in the room and you're anxious, and you can't turn your brain off because you keep thinking about everything else. What'd that boy say? What'd my mom say? Do I gotta do this? I gotta do this, I gotta do this. I gotta do this, I can't come to church on Sunday. I gotta do this, I, got, I, gotta, I, can't, I can't make it a small group. I can't come to PYA. I can't pray in the morning, I can't read my word. Because you're so focused on everything else that you're missing the whole reason why you're here on this earth to get connected, to share the gospel, to live and breathe the word of God out into your daily life, wherever you are placed, you're missing it. And I love you all way too much, this crowd of people, the 120, 30, whatever it is in this room, and telling you that if you are wasting your time on everything else in the world, you are missing it. And I, I'm serious when I say wasting, because doing these things Whatever you are, whatever you fall into that category is not advancing Jesus. Now, what you can do over here, you can glorify God in it. Absolutely, right? So you can be the bank teller. You can be the teacher. You can be the soccer coach. You could be the comedian. I don't care what you are. You can do those things and glorify God. But what I'm saying is if you're just doing it just to check off the box and get the check every two weeks, and if you're just doing it because it makes you look good and you just want to put a picture, a picture on Instagram, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. So Mary and Martha are sitting there, and I can imagine what's probably taking place is Jesus is saying, why is Mary here and Martha's here? And so in verse 41, he says, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. Story of Martha and Mary, two women who love God, two women who Jesus loved. One's focused, one's not. And Jesus' response when Martha gets upset with God, Jesus, Jesus, Lord, Lord, are you not going to tell her to help me? His response is, she's doing the right thing. She's connected. She's with me. And I can, I can almost think about being in that situation because that's what my day looks like sometimes. On that Saturday morning when I just want to do my own thing, and I want to lay in bed an extra hour or two longer. I'm like, man, where, where am I going in my day today? What am, I, what am I really aligning my heart to? And I'm not saying you got to start out at 5 a.m. and get connected with God, but maybe you just spend a little bit. And I'm not even going to tell you to put 20 minutes or 30 minutes down, but just spend a time. Because you can get connected with God in one minute, and you can get connected with God in an hour. And so he's bigger than time. 
So if you sit here and you come out here, I'm going to spend 15 minutes with God tomorrow morning, and that's going to encourage me, and that's going to take me. That's great. That's awesome. I'm going to read one chapter. Stop focusing on the time. Stop focusing on the length of how much you read the Bible. Just get focused on Jesus. Because every day is different. There's some days where I read one verse, and I'm like, man, I'm fulfilled. There's some days where I read two chapters, and I'm like, I don't know what's happening. But if I just focus on the connection with God, like Mary sitting there at the feet saying, I don't, I don't know what's to the left, I don't know what's to the right, but I need Jesus. I don't want to miss this. I don't want you guys to miss this. So realigning is important. Realigning is saying, maybe my Thursday night looks different. Maybe it's realigning and saying small group is important. Maybe it's saying serving on a go team is important. Maybe it's saying coming to church on a Sunday is important. Maybe it's saying coming to a first Tuesday is important. Or maybe it's saying, hey, I just need to take a step back and stop saying yes to everything. I'm in the club. I'm doing this. I got these friends and I got these friends and I hang out with my church friends here and I hang out with my my work friends here and then I hang out with my boyfriend's friends here and you're just here, here. You're everywhere and you're burning out. You're not making time to ask yourself or maybe even ask God, hey, wh- where do I need to be? Where do you want me? Do you want me planted in this church? And if that answer is yes, be a part of it. Be a part of our family. Showing up on Tuesday is not a part of it. That's just one pit. Showing up on Sunday, it's a big church though. And nobody knows your name. 200 people in the PYA ministry. I know a lot of the names, but it's hard for me to know all of them. So that's why we got small group leaders that say, I know your name. I know your story. I know your mom. I know your dad got COVID. I'm in the hospital with you. I'm picking you up from the party when you get drunk. I'm picking you up from your friend's house when you didn't know weren't supposed to be there. I'm knocking on your door when you're not supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because small group is accountability it's connection, it's community, it's this Acts 2 model, right, of we're breaking the bread together, we're living, we're praying, we're walking and doing life with one another. Because this 35 minutes is not enough, and Reg's 40 minutes is not enough, and the worship band singing Great Are You, Lord, is not enough. Too much is happening, too much distractions, too many desires, too flesh. I know my flesh. If I go 30 days without this, if I go seven days without this, I should not be on this stage. Because I'm prideful. I'm selfish. And when I walk away from God for long enough, I am me, 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 me. And I don't want anybody to be around me because I can go back to where I used to be. But then you meet God and everything changes. See, if I could just tell you this, and this is off, but there is more to life than a relationship. There's more to life than graduating. There's more to life than your job. There's more to life than what your parents say they want you to do. There's more to life than what you are doing right now. There is a big world, and there's an even bigger eternity that has your name written on it. And so maybe you're the first timers that walked in the door. Man, I'm so glad you guys are here, but I want you to take your next step. I want you to get connected to a small group because there's more than this. And maybe you've been coming for a long time. Maybe you showed up every single Tuesday and you showed up and you said, man, I'm, I'm here, I'm bought in. But there is more. And it starts in here. It's not about this. It's here. And when it goes from your head to your heart, that's when we start making miracles. That's when Jesus starts moving in your life because it's no longer just in your head. You're not just spitting off verses and you're not just putting it in your Instagram captions and you're not just putting it in your bio. You're not just texting it to a friend. You're living it out. You're walking in it. You're talking in it. And when you start walking and talking in it, man, people want to be around you. And you start getting confidence You start realizing, man, I'm no longer who I was. Man, those lies that I thought about myself, that's not true. 
Because your identity becomes rooted in something called Jesus' word. And when you start getting God's word inside of your life, and you start memorizing scripture, and you start walking and talking what the scripture says about you, when you get depressed late at night in your room, and the guy breaks up with you, or you start forgetting, or you start maybe not even realizing what your worth is anymore, you start speaking scripture over your life. You start getting plugged into small, and you're small to be the You are. You are good enough. You got people on your team. And I know what it feels like to be 18 to 25. It's hard. There's comparison. There's traps. There's temptation. But it doesn't get easier when you turn 26. It doesn't go away when you turn 32. It doesn't go away when you get kids. Stop thinking the idea of, oh, well, I can just hang out right now. Maybe when I turn 30. No. I got parents, adults in my life that are struggling with the same thing they were at 23 years old. Things keep going if you don't address them. And actually, they get worse. So right now when you've got community, because you go move off to some other city, or you walk away from, you know, 26 or whatever it is, it gets harder. There is no PYA. It's just a big church on Sunday, and you got to figure it out on your own. And you get plugged into a small group. Our church is incredible about that. They want to know your name. They want to ask where you live at. And they want to say, hey, I'm going to call you. I'm going to make sure you show up. But it's hard. It's not getting easier. And as time goes on, and as time goes on, and culture keeps saying no to God, and the door keeps closing, no on religion, no to Christianity, canceled it's only going to get harder. And so if you don't have the word of God in your heart and you don't know what the word of God says about you, then you're going to believe everything on Instagram and everything on CNN and everything on Fox. And you're going to believe everything your parents say. But if you know the word of God for yourself, then it will sustain you. But it's got to start here, not just in your head. Because you can know scripture all day long, but if it's not implanted on your heart, you're missing it. You're missing it. So Matthew 13, 10 through 23, it's a parable of the sower. If you guys have ever read it, it's a, it's a challenging one, but it's definitely something I think that this semester we're going to sit in over the next probably couple months or so. And I'm just going to read it to you guys. And um, I hope that as I'm reading this, you can either find yourself in one of the positions or one of the spots. And so it says this in verse 10, the same day Jesus went out to the house and sat by the lake, such large crowds gathered around him and that he got into a boat and sat in it. While all the people stood on the shore, he, then he told them many things in parables, saying, Farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came up and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had, not, they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked out the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. The disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to people in parables? He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken away from them. This is why I speak in parables. Though seeing, they do not see. Though hearing, they do not hear or understand. In them is fulfilled the, prof the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For the people's heart has, been, has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see their eyes Hear, their, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I will heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it. And to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refuses, 
to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble and persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of their life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So here we got three things of soil, right? Good soil, rocky soil, thorny soil. I don't know the stories of every single person in this room, but we all fall into one of these categories, right? So we got rocky soil, verse 20. It says this, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once perceives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So rocky soil is going to represent someone who is loving God, but maybe they're too busy to make time or space. They show up here and there. Uh, they are kind of got things going on in their life and really just kind of hoping and praying every now and then that things are just going to get better. So that's the rocky soil. Then we've got thor- thorny soil. It says in verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. So the thorny soil is going to be someone who comes to PYA once a month. Maybe they come to church on, you know, a Sunday or so here and there. And they think what they're doing is going to sustain them. And so they keep walking and they keep talking. And they've got a heart for God, right? But they're living this double life. And so their Saturdays look different than their Sundays. Their Monday nights look different than their small group night. They're showing up, but they're not really invested. They're kind of half-heartedly living out this life. They're talking this way and they're doing another thing. That's somebody on the, on the thorny soil. And then we've got good soil, which is verse 23. It says, the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So the good soil is going to represent someone creating time with Jesus, getting in a small group, we're serving, we're being the church, and they're wanting to go from here to here, and they're wanting to grow. And so if we're being honest, we're either good, rocky, or thorny. And if you know anything about planting or gardening, you know it's a lot easier to kill a plant than keep it alive. And I'm not a gardener, I promise. But what I have here is some seeds, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to commit for the next three months. So all of September, all of October, and all of November. And the first PYA Tuesday in December, I'm going to hopefully have three of these plants, and one of them is going to be sprouted. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to plant some of these seeds into each of them. And these seeds are the word of God, right? So I'm going to commit to you guys to faithfully take care of all three of these plants with seeds in them for the next three months. And I'm asking you, good, rocky, or thorny, to commit to the same thing. Putting the word of God in you. Now, here's the, here's the kicker, though. Is I could faithfully take care of all three of these. And this one's going to die, and this one's going to die. And this one is going to sprout up. I can check off every box. I can do every single thing that I think I'm supposed to do to be an awesome and amazing Christian. This one's going to live on. And so I'm asking you to make the decision. Maybe you're thorny, maybe you're rocky, and if maybe you are good, then this word of God is planted and rooted inside of you. Great, but there's more. And so we're gonna be faithful this semester. I'm gonna challenge everybody in this room 
that if you're on these two sides of the pillar, and even if you're on this one, be faithful. Be faithful in the word of God and implant it into your heart. Because in three months, if a room of 130 people could be faithful, I promise you, come December, I cannot wait to see what this ministry will look like. But if we're sitting over here, what's going to happen is, is you're going to keep doing it. You're going to keep walking. You're going to keep showing up. You're going to keep checking the box. And it's going to grow a little bit. But you're going to eventually get withered out. And it's going to choke you out. And it's not sustainable. It's, I mean, it's, this is what the word, this is not my opinion. I'm not, I'm not a gardener. This is literally it. And so as we walk through this semester, if you're not on good soil, it's not about works. It's not about doing things. It's about finding a real, authentic relationship with Jesus. And good soil, a pot with soil in it to grow, it doesn't happen overnight. I wish I could tell you guys that, man, you're going to make a decision tonight. You're going to get plugged into a small group. And then next month in October, yip de doo it's going to take faithfulness. It's going to take perseverance. It's going to take some hard moments in your life for you to be honest and real with yourself. It's going to take you getting accountability. It might take a mentor. It might take a really hard season in your life, but you remaining faithful and the word of God being planted in you will produce good soil. And so I believe that in December, if I faithfully take care of all three of these, this is going to be the one that's going to grow. This one's going to have nothing in it. And this one is going to be worse probably than what it was. Because the plant with good soil will prosper. And in John 15, it talks about getting connected to the vine. And when you connect to the vine, it produces fruit. And it's not a fruit tree, so I don't know what this is going to... Uh, hopefully, it's got some leaves and it looks really nice. But this one right here is going to be a lot better than these two. And if you're in these camps, you can jump over any time you want to. You can make the decision tomorrow morning, tonight, next week, next month. It's not over for these people. It's not over. There's a chance. There's opportunities. And so if it's not tonight, it's tomorrow. Maybe it's next week. But if you keep putting it off because you don't have time, I think you're lying to yourself. And if you truthfully do not have time, then you might have an idol in your life that you might really need to rearrange your life in. Because if you really, really, really do not have time, we need to ask a really deeper question if you can't make time for the one who created you, for the one who knows the hairs, for the one that knows you and what you did and what you're going to do, you're missing out. And so I want us, as we get ready to sing this next song of worship, I want us to ask maybe the question, what pot am I? And challenge yourself to say, if I'm rocky or thorny or even good, God, where do you want me? What can I do to love and serve you? And what can I do to grow? Not just here, but here. And I believe if every single person in this room makes a decision to say, I want good soil. I want the word of God. I want to be planted. I want to sprout. I want to get connected to the vine. And I want to produce fruit. Come December, not only will we have a plant that's grown out of this, but we will have people that are living and breathing all over Southeast Texas that love God and love people and they want to make a difference. And that right there is why we gather and that's why we meet because there's something bigger than us and there's things bigger for us to do. But we got to get roots. We got to get down. Before we can go here, we got to get deeper. And it starts with these seeds planting it in us, growing. So challenge yourself. Figure out where you're at. 
It's different for every single person in this room. There is no shame if you're on the rocky side. There's no shame if you're on the thorny side. And if you're on the good side, man, don't get complacent because that's a really, really, really hard place to be in also. There is more. I promise that. So let me pray. And as we're singing this song, man, if you got a decision that you want to make, our prayer team is going to be spread out across the room that I would want you guys to say, hey, I'm in a different spot right now. Can somebody pray for me? Or maybe there's an opportunity for you to go find a small group leader or whatever it is, but take a step tonight. Plant yourself in good soil tonight. And let's commit. Give me three months Three months of committing to a small group. Three months of committing, of just saying, I want to grow. Three months of committing that I'm going to read the word of God. Three months of committing and saying, this semester is yours. Before I get to my Pike, before I get to my Segev, before I get to my sorority, before I get to my friend's house, before I get to my boyfriend, before I get to any other place, to TV, Instagram, whatever it is, I'm going to get connected to here first. Give me three months of that, and I promise you, we will see physically and emotionally and spiritually something grew. So let's pray. God, thank you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. God, I pray that you would move in and through the lives of us tonight. God, that we would take with the word of God, we would plant it into our hearts, and we would sprout. We would plant God, I pray we would commit our lives to you. There'd be no shame. There'd be no guilt. There'd be no condemnation. God, that we would commit tonight to loving you. Let our worship be true. Let it be authentic. And let it be about you. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for this ministry. Thank you for this church. And thank you for the 18 and 25-year-olds that said yes to you. It's in your name I pray.